An Afghan policewoman shoots and kills an American advisor outside police headquarters in Kabul. Officials say it's still not clear if the shooting was another insider attack by Afghans. Peace envoy Lakhdar Brahimi meets Syrian President Bashar al-Assad to discuss a solution to the country's 21-month-old conflict. Brahimi's visit comes as a government airstrike on a bakery kills more than 60 people. And India's Prime Minister is appealing for calm in the face of violent protests against the brutal gang rape of a 23-year-old student. All these stories and more next on Ebru Today. Welcome to Ebru Today. We bring the world to your world. I'm Mia Toski. And I'm Francesca Maxime and for Brian Jenkins. Thanks so much for joining us this Christmas Eve, December 24th, 2012. Uh, today, Francesca, it's going to be likely another busy holiday travel day. Now we're going to get you all updated on all the weather. But first, we're going to start things off in Afghanistan. That is right. As people around the world are celebrating, we have some sad news from Afghanistan. An Afghan police woman has killed an American advisor at the Kabul police headquarters. Kabul's deputy police chief says they are still investigating whether the killing was intentional or accidental. It is also not known whether the victim was a U.S. military or civilian advisor. NATO's military command says it's looking into reports of the shooting. More than 50 international troops have been killed by Afghan soldiers or police this year alone and a number of other assaults, including, quote, insider attacks, are still under investigation. NATO forces, due to mostly withdrawal from the country by 2014, have stepped up efforts to train and advise Afghan military and police units before the pullout. Other sad news from Syria. Dozens of people have been killed and dozens more wounded in a government airstrike on a bakery in Halfaya. That's a town recently captured by rebels. Now, many are calling this incident the deadliest airstrike of the Civil War. Since fighting began 21 months ago, more than 44,000 people have been killed. But Syria's information minister showed optimism toward the settlement of the Syrian crisis. He made the remarks during a news briefing in Damascus. Ebru Today's Sherry Richardson is live in our New York City bureau with the story. Good morning, Sherry. Good morning, Mia. The information uh, minister said that Syria has many religious extremist groups with their members being no different from terrorists. Omran al-Zubi, Syria's information minister, stressed that overseas opposition groups backed up armed terrorists in Syria, and the information they released on the progress of their fighting were entirely groundless. The minister added that the current situation is still controlled by the Syrian government troops. He said all Syrian political parties willing for a political solution are attending the ongoing dialogues to solve the crisis through a peaceful manner. He emphasized that the future of Syria is decided by the Syrian people, and the rejection to dialogues by overseas opposition groups only prolong Syrian suffering. As for the proposal on the political transition raised by the international community, al-Zubi responded that the Syrian government welcomes it, but still needs to exchange details with relevant countries. Meanwhile, the international envoy tasked with ending Syria's civil war hopes to discuss ways of ending the crisis during a visit to Damascus. But there appeared little reason for optimism after a government airstrike on a bakery killed dozens of people. Lakhdar Brahimi, who represents the United Nations and the Arab League, has made little apparent progress towards brokering an end to the violence since he assumed his post in September, mostly because neither side appears interested in talks. Brahimi's trip, his third to Damascus since taking his post, appeared troubled from the start. Instead of flying directly to Syria as he has on previous visits, Brahimi landed in Beirut and traveled to the Syrian capital by land because of fighting near Damascus airport. Brahimi has met with President Bashar al-Assad. He said the two exchanged views on the crisis and possible steps forward, but he did not discuss the details. Reporting live from New York City, I'm Sherry Richardson. Mia? Well, Sherry, is there any idea what Assad said? Mia, a Syria's state news agency quoted Assad as saying his government supports, quote, any effort in the interest of the Syrian people that preserves the homeland's sovereignty and independence. Mia? Well, we'll certainly be watching. Thanks so much, Sherry. 
Well, authorities in India have shut down roads in the heart of the capital on Monday to put an end to week-long demonstrations against the brutal gang rape of a woman in a moving bus. Every Today's Erin Aid brings us more on this story. Erin. That's right, Francesca. Now, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh appealed for calm and promise, and promised that the government would take action to prevent crimes against women in the future. I appeal to all concerned citizens to maintain peace and calm. I assure you that we will make all possible efforts to ensure security and safety of women in this country. There has been outrage across India over the December 16th gang rape that left a young woman in critical condition in a hospital. Police used tear gas and water cannons and hit protesters with batons during weekend protests throughout India. I feel deeply sad at the turn of events leading to clashes between protesters and police forces. Anger at this crime is justified, but violence will serve no purpose. The 23-year-old victim and her companion were attacked after getting a ride on a chartered bus. Police said men on the bus gang raped the woman and beat her and her companion with iron rods as the bus drove through the city for hours, even passing through police checkpoints. The assailants eventually stripped the pair and dumped them on the side of the road. The victim is being treated for severe internal injuries in a New Delhi government hospital. Thousands of armed police and paramilitary troops blocked roads in central New Delhi on Monday to prevent protesters from marching to the presidential palace. Now, after battling the protesters throughout the day on Sunday, authorities early on Sunday, excuse me, battling them throughout the day on Saturday, then early on Sunday, banned their entry into high security zones, which also housed the offices of the Prime Minister of Defense and External Affairs Ministries. Such a troubling story. Such a troubling story, and, and sure to only develop further, so we'll keep an eye on this. All right, thanks so much, Erin. Very welcome. And we do have more on that situation in India, a very tense one in the capital following that brutal gang rape over a week ago. Joining us now live from India for more on the anger and the outrage on the streets of New Delhi is senior journalist Makruk Inayeth. Makruk, can you please describe the situation in New Delhi at the moment? Have major streets been shut down there? All right, well, we have lost our connection there, but we will certainly resume the uh, story when we get that interview. In other news, the head of the National Rifle Association, or NRA, says there needs to be armed guards in schools to keep children safe. Now, the comments were made just one week after the deadly shootings in Newtown, Connecticut. The gun group refused to comment immediately after the killings, but broke their silence over the weekend. Now their remarks are generating a lot of controversy. Our Washington-based correspondent Robin Hamilton has more. And Robin, I would say a little controversy on this one. Mia, to say the least, you know, immediately after the shootings in Newtown, people were really waiting to see what the largest gun advocacy group would say, particularly as many are pushing for more gun legislation. Well, well, with this new statement that just came out, it's really not what many people expected. And now it is the NRA is facing a lot of criticism, not only from the public, but from lawmakers. The head of the National Rifle Association, or NRA, made no apologies for his stance on how to protect children in the future after the horrific shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary. If it's crazy to call for putting police and armed security in our school to protect our children, then call me crazy. I'll tell you what the American people, I think the American people think it's crazy not to do it. It's the one thing that would keep people safe, and the NRA is going to try to do that. The declaration to have police and security guards carry weapons as they patrol schools came as a surprise to some who are calling for better gun control laws after the deaths of 27 people. In a video address, the president said he would work with Congress to create effective legislation to push for more gun control, which could be agreeable to most people. However, the NRA's unwillingness to work with any new laws has raised concern with leaders in Congress. Well, I think he's so extreme and so tone deaf that he actually helps the cause of us passing sensible gun legislation in the Congress. If it involves any new gun 
The NRA again has reiterated that they are against any type of legislation that would ban weapons, but instead they say they are offering a comprehensive plan that would put armed security guards in schools throughout the country. Mia? Well, Rob, and obviously Republicans are supportive of the NRA, but how are they reacting to this statement? Well, that's a great question. It's puts them in a very difficult position because they've been very quiet since the shootings and they have not said what type of legislation they would support in terms of banning certain weapons. So we'll have to see what they're going to do next. Well, the next question is funding uh, for the, that suggestion that they have. Thank you so right. much. We'll see you soon. Meantime, Egypt's opposition is alleging voter fraud in the Constitution after a passed over the weekend. Opposition leaders are now urging the government to investigate, but supporters say it is legitimate. Though there were no violent protests over the weekend, it doesn't look like the turmoil is over either. Egyptians went to the polls and approved a new constitution. That's what state news media said on Sunday, but the headlines made it clear that the political brawl will likely continue. Supporters call it a legitimate constitution, and its passage will be watched across the Arab world. Its approval is a victory for President Mohamed Morsi of the Muslim Brotherhood, claiming it passed with a 64 percent yes vote. The referendum is not the end of the road. It's only a beginning in a long struggle over Egypt's future, and we will not allow to change the identity of Egypt or the return of tyranny at all. The opposition has alleged voter fraud and is now demanding an investigation, a sign that the referendum will not end the turmoil that has roiled this country for nearly two years since the uprising that ousted the former president, Hosni Mubarak. Egyptians had hoped the new constitution might usher in a period of more stability, but a heated political debate over the past month leading up to the referendum at times erupted into deadly street battles. But there were no mass opposition demonstrations on Sunday after the unofficial results came out, but activists continued to camp out in the capitals to rear square, saying they will continue to oppose the results. We will also confront any regulations that might come out from the Shura or Upper House, Shura Council or Upper House, which might, in, might influence the interests of the people in their future. And we will also work in all democratic means to change this constitution. Tensions continue to have a toxic effect on Egypt's already precarious economy. Tourism is down. The finance ministry announced the budget deficit reached 13 billion U.S. dollars in the past five months. And the International Monetary Fund pushed back a $4 billion loan because of the turmoil. And there is more news from overseas. Now it's time to look at today's newspapers. And Francesca is over at the Live Touch with a look at what the foreign press is covering for us. Where are you taking us to first? Well, we're going to start over in Greece, Mia, with this story. Of course, the economy continues to be uh, major news over there. The Catamarini newspaper, the economist at the heart of the Eurozone negotiations, says the country will not need further major austerity measures like the one that will be implemented next year. Thomas Weiser says the 9 billion euros in spending cuts and tax hikes will be the last package of such a large scale. The Austrian also said that Greece's Eurozone partners and the IMF have ensured that Athens will be fully funded until the end of 2014 and if there is a need for more financing it will be discussed next year. And we're going now to the Hindu newspaper to India where we continue to follow the awful story of that gang rape on a bus. The victim of that rape, a 23-year-old student, is said to be back on a ventilator after developing respiratory problems. Protesters have gathered at India Gate in New Delhi with reports of several people being injured. Police used batons, tear gas, water cannons, all against protest protesters on Sunday in an effort to calm tempers. In all, 78 policemen and over 100 others were injured. To the China Daily Now, check out this picture. You can see the uh, major amounts of snow there. A cold snap is causing traffic delays in parts of China. Two tourists also stranded on a mountain there have died. Some temperatures have fallen far below 20 degrees Celsius in the inner Mongolia autonomous region, Fujian and Guangdong provinces. Highways in one coastal town were temporarily closed due to heavy snow. Temperatures in inner Mongolia fell, if you can believe this, to minus 40 below over the weekend. Freezing. And to Korea, 
Look at that, quite a backdrop there. This photo in South Korea's Army's weekend duty, looking at the inter-Korean border from inside the demilitarized zone. North Korea launched a rocket, you'll remember, on December 12th, with the first stage falling in waters off of South's west coast and the other debris falling into the waters off of the Philippines. Adding to speculation, the North's recent rocket launch was intended to rest its Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Technology, or ICBM technology. South Korean officials now say that they saw a highly toxic chemical that was actually used to fuel that rocket launch. And to Canada now, we have a sweet story to end with here. If I can get down there to the bottom man's best friend, the Toronto Star, uh, about saving Afghanistan's beloved war dogs. This one, a story about Canadian soldiers that are footing the bill for $3,000 to bring dogs from Afghanistan over to Canada. This picture is of Gordon Roy and the stray dog Guts. That's his name right there. His little poochy face. You gotta love it. <laughs> that dog from Afghanistan. Most of those dogs there are considered more vermin than pets and often harassed, tortured, killed, or used for fighting. Clearly, uh, they bonded with some of these soldiers and they have a much better life coming up for them in Canada than they did in Afghanistan. Mia? Well, that looks like a nice reuniting uh, for, for the holidays. Yes, so very exactly. nice story. Exactly. All right, thanks, Francesca. And coming up next on Ever Today, more than 200 flood warnings and alerts have been issued across much of the UK. We'll take a look at how residents are preparing for a wet Christmas. And red alert in Chile after a volcano begins spewing gas and ash. We'll have the latest on how the eruptions have affected travel and evacuations. And a U.S. senator issues an apology after being arrested for a DWI. We'll have more on that story whenever today returns. Welcome back to Every Today here on this Christmas Eve. It's pretty mild out there today in the Northeast. Yeah, Northeast. We're New Jersey and New York, mm -hmm. but uh, it, we may get a few flurries, we're told. But uh, white across Christmas. the pond in the <laughs> UK, it is not looking like a very white Christmas. In fact, uh, widespread flooding across parts of the UK is making for a very soggy Christmas. More than 200 flood warnings remain in effect today as rain is forecast yet again for Christmas and Christmas mm -hmm. Eve. Mm -hmm. Northeast Scotland, Southwest England, and Wales have been the hardest hit areas so far. In Stonehaven, Aberdeenshire, residents were assessing the damage to their homes and vehicles after the town flooded overnight. Martin O'Donnell said he abandoned his flat after water started pouring through his front door. I looked outside the window and my car at the front was just completely covered in, uh, in water came through here. You know, and it was starting to leak under the floors from the front door. Uh, and then within sort of half an hour, 40 minutes, it just started to actually burst through the sides of the door. Uh, and that was it really, and there was no stopping it. You know, we just we ended up going up to a flat upstairs. At Stonehaven Catering Company, Cool Gourmet, flooding ruined the turkeys and other food being prepared in advance for customers' Christmas dinners. We are going to have to recook all the Christmas meals for, I don't know, 20, 30 odd folk at least. Um, we've already phoned some folk to say it's a cheesecake. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to make that for you. Jeff Boyd from the UK's Environment Agency said that this year has been so wet that the ground is saturated with water. We, we are in the winter period now. It's very unlikely that the ground will be able to dry out now until the spring. Therefore, as the ground will stay very wet or saturated over this period of time, any significant rain could le lead to a risk of localized or widespread flooding. Floods have disrupted transport across the country, just as people were trying to visit relatives for the holidays. Engineers were working to fix the damage after the floodwaters receded earlier, but travelers have been forced to make alternative plans. A white Christmas, a wet Christmas, sounds like a wet one. All right, to South America now, where a grumbling volcano in Chile has the country on alert. The government issued a red alert for the volcano, which is on the border with Argentina as it's become increasingly active. Officials activated the alert Sunday after the volcano started spewing gas in a cloud of ash almost a mile high. Flight operators expected to pass through the area were also issued cautions. Right now, officials are not issuing any evacuation orders, but at least one livestock farmer was seen herding her sheep away. Uh, another volcano in southern Chile erupted last year, forcing the cancellation of hundreds of flights and the evacuation of thousands of people. 
Well, we're going to change things up a little bit now, and she made her acting debut at the London Olympics. <laughs> yeah, I remember that video. <laughs> <laughs> well, now Queen Elizabeth II is hitting the big screen again, this time in 3D, Francesca. All right. Well, the Monarch's traditional Christmas Day message will be filmed in 3D for the first time. It's expected to pay tribute to the world's athletes for delivering a splendid summer of sport at the London Olympics. The 86-year-old head of state provided an Olympic highlight. You may remember that when she made a surprise appearance with James Bond in a short film for the opening ceremonies. Uh, this year's Christmas Day message was pre-recorded and will go out as expected, but Buckingham Palace said the Queen missed a church service at her country retreat on Sunday due to a cold. Her holiday message culminates a year of celebrations marking the Queen's 60 years on the throne. All right, well, to Idaho now. Senator Michael Crapo has apologized to his family and his constituents for being arrested and charged with driving under the influence in suburban Washington, D.C. Police say Crapo was stopped for running a red light early Sunday and was arrested after failing sobriety tests. He was released after about four hours on an unsecured bond. Police say Crapo registered a blood alcohol level over the legal limit. In a statement, the senator said that he does accept total responsibility and will deal with whatever penalty comes his way. Crapo, a member of the Mormon Church, has previously said that he did not drink alcohol. Well, will he or won't he? That's the question on everyone's mind regarding Italy's Mario Monti. Now, just two days ago, the Prime Minister handed in his resignation and said he won't run again in February. It is still undecided in Italy whether the next elections will be a duel between Berlusconi and the leader of the Democratic Party, Mr. Bersani, or whether there will be three competitors. Monti made it clear that he's rejecting an offer from his predecessor, Silvio Berlusconi, uh, to run on a center-right election ticket, citing Berlusconi's heavy criticism of his economic policies. Now, Monti's decision ends weeks of speculation that have dominated Italian politics and preoccupied the European Union, which is eager to see Monti's financial reforms continue. Well, the holiday season is the perfect time to not only remember those less fortunate, but to give people in need a helping hand. One Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit group, Food for Friends, is delivering thousands of meals to the hungry. The group estimates that they will deliver more than 80,000 meals this month. One of the beneficiaries is 86-year-old Ruby Bishop, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease about one and a half years ago. Get it. Her daughter has been looking after her. When Food and Friends comes every other week, they're bringing groceries for my mom, uh, which also includes myself, and it has really helped me tremendously because a lot of times I'm not able to get out to the store. The organization has about 30 to 50 volunteers at any given time. Karen Fitzgerald has been volunteering for 21 years. Oh, it's, it's huge. I mean, when I first started, we took care of 60 clients, and now it's 600 a day. There are a handful of regular volunteers, but the number of volunteers increases dramatically between Thanksgiving and Christmas. We like to think of the holidays as kind of a recruitment time for year-round volunteers. Hopefully, the holiday spirit of helping your neighbors could carry on through the year, especially during the cold winter months ahead. to see people giving back. All right, now for a look at today's domestic papers. Mia's over at the Live Touch with headlines from across the USA. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to start things off in the middle of the country in Minneapolis, and that's going to be with the Star Tribune. And though it is the holiday season, and it's supposed to be a happy time, right? Well, millions of people in the U.S. have big worries on their plate. It's another kind of fiscal cliff that is looming for more than 2 million Americans. This man right here is one of them. Now, their unemployment insurance will expire at the end of the year unless Congress renews a program that gives extra aid to people who have used up their six months of unemployment checks. Here in Minnesota, there are more than 12,000 people who could be affected. And over here, you know, we've been talking about the NRA Rejected. Well, let's take that up back up there. NRA rejects any new gun laws. Now, the National Rifle Association was rather outspoken over the weekend, saying guns aren't the problem. 
criminals are the problem. Now, they are calling for armed guards in every single school, as we reported earlier. Now, the comments have been met with widespread criticism across the U.S. Those who oppose guns don't like the idea of guns in schools, but this proposal also has many asking, who's going to fund putting guns inside schools? There's the big question. And over here in the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, this is a church, then they were having a special service over the weekend. Now, there were a lot of questions across the country about whether to cancel Christmas masses because of the shooting in Newtown. And that's because many of the families of the victims actually came forward and said, we need Christmas more than ever. Now, all places of worship remained open over the weekend in Newtown and in places of worship here in Philadelphia. There were even special songs written especially for the victims. Now, because of all this outpouring of support throughout the country and even the world, Newtown, has now asked that all people who want to donate do so, but give to your own communities. We're going to also share a couple of fun stories. I think this is just really a fun story. This is uh, the San Francisco Chronicle. This is Ronald and Reginald Richardson, okay? This is Claremont Middle School, and there's not one, but two principals. These are the uh, two brothers there. They're also identical twins. So for the kids who think it and get into trouble, well, you better think twice. Get it? You gotta think twice. So you have double the discipline, but you also have double the inspiration. Now it seems that this school was struggling earlier in the year. There were four principals last year, but since the Richardson brothers have come to town, morale is up, grades have improved, and behavior problems are down. Each morning, you can see these guys right here. They <laughs> greet the students and the parents with a smile, and they send them off that way as well. And this, by the way, is the only school in America with two principals who are identical twins. All right, over here to USA Today. Give and your heart expands. Now, it's a little story about giving. Now, this year with Sandy and the tragedy in Newtown, and of course the holidays, a lot of people are giving more to charities. Well, that's a good thing. It's not only a win-win for the needy, but it's also, here's what doctors say, it's also good for your health. When you give more, it lowers your blood pressure, it boosts your, your endorphins, and as this headline says, your heart expands as well. And finally, over to the Seattle, Times. That's all the way out west. Uh, yeah, this is a very, very important study. Now, scientists have made a fascinating discovery into Rudolph's red nose. Here's the deal. It appears that reindeer noses have flowing red blood cells and hairpin-like capillaries, and that regulates temperature. So Rudolph's bright nose right over here, it's unusual, but finally, after all these years, they have explained it. And if you think this is some kind of reindeer game, well, their results were published in the British Medical Association. So after centuries, Francesca, scientists <laughs> have finally given an answer to this very baffling question. They have cracked the code of the red nose, and it's not just because he has a cold. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, no. has nothing, nothing to do with that. For the there is a reason for that red nose. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the explanation, Mia. Well, just ahead on every today, a new line of luxury cars leaves a very small carbon footprint. Now, experts predict they will be the hottest rides in 2013. And a man with a passion for planes have decided to make one of them his home. Is he nuts or just passionate? I don't know. We'll take you on a tour of his dream retreat. Welcome back to Every Today here on this Christmas Eve. I'm Francesca Maxime. Now let's have a recap of our top stories today. Here is Erin Aid with the very latest. Erin. Thank you very much, Francesca. An American advisor in Afghanistan has been killed at police headquarters in Kabul. An Afghan policewoman opened fire on an American advisor. An investigation is underway to determine if the shooting was intentional or accidental. It's not known whether the American was a military or civilian advisor. There has been a rise in incidents in which Afghan security forces have shot dead either foreign personnel or their own colleagues. The shooting came just hours after an Afghan policeman shot five of his colleagues at a checkpoint in the northern part of the country. Syria's Special Envoy Lakhdar Brahimi met President Bashar al-Assad in Damascus on Monday to discuss a solution to the country's 20-month-old, 21-month-old conflict. Brahimi told reporters his meeting with Assad dealt with the general conditions in Syria. He said the two men discussed potential solutions to a crisis that has killed more than 44,000 people. The meeting on Monday was Brahimi's third with Assad, and violence has greatly escalated in that time. 
Rahimi's visit comes as government warplanes hit a bakery in the Hama province on Sunday, killing and wounding dozens of residents. And Indian Prime Minister Mamahan Singh has appealed for calm in the capital of Delhi following violent protests over a gang rape of a woman. Singh said his government would make all possible efforts to ensure security and safety to all women. More than 100 people were hurt in clashes over the weekend. Police say at least 60 officers were injured. The rape, which happened on a bus in Delhi, left a woman in critical condition and has caused outrage in India. Those are just some of your top stories for this Monday, December 24th, 2012. All right, Erin, thanks so much Very for that. Welcome. Well, now for a feature that we call the 65s. It's five stories from all around the globe in just 60 seconds. Sri Lankan authorities say 100 Chinese nationals living in the capital, Colombo, have been arrested for telecom fraud. Sri Lankan and Chinese police teamed up to make the arrests. Dozens of people have died in Russia after temperatures plunged below freezing in the capital, Moscow, and other regions. Hundreds have been hospitalized for hypothermia and frostbite due to the cold snap. Germany has updated its internet laws to beef up online security and protect the youth against hidden dangers. The country has always prioritized internet security and data protection. People gathered in churches across South Africa to pray for the speedy recovery of Nelson Mandela. The anti-apartheid icon has been hospitalized with a lung infection for more than a fortnight. And in Peru, a pet boutique in Lima is selling a new line of festive Christmas outfits for dogs. The costumes come in all sizes, for breeds as small as Chihuahuas and as big as St. Bernard's. Gotta love the pet costumes. All right, well now for a look at the forecast. It looks like some of us just might get a white Christmas, right Erin? Erin is in for Matt Locker today. I sure am, Francesca, and I like those pet costumes too. I have to get one for my dog. <laughs> so if you're dreaming of a white Christmas, if so, your dream may just come true, especially if you're in the western portion of the U.S. Now, snow from winter storm Euclid Great name for a winter storm, Euclid, that moves through the Rockies and High Plains this Christmas Eve. And some higher mountain locations from northern Idaho and down into Utah and Colorado could see 6 to 12 inches of snow. Meanwhile, showers diminish in Southern California and a new storm hits the Pacific Northwest, the whole region and Northern California on Christmas Day. Now, if we take a trip over to the Midwest, we'll make that a little bit larger for you to see. A weak system brings some light snow to parts of the Great Lake region around here. You can see the snow although that's the blue and the pink in that area. And it's going to be in the Great Lakes and Northern Ohio Valley on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Snowfall will be anywhere from a trace to an inch or two. And later in the day, light snow from that winter storm Euclid again, that will begin to move into the high plains and Western South Dakota and Nebraska region over here. And temperatures will be five to 20 degrees below average in the plains, but slightly above average in the Southern Great Lakes and Eastern Ohio Valley. Now let's take the snow off for you. And we'll go to, oop, where we go? All right. And you can just see the cloud cover up here. We're going over to the northeast in this area where we're broadcasting from today to you guys. Now, a weak system will bring some snow to western Maryland and much of Pennsylvania all around here. It's under the clouds, I swear. And uh, northern New Jersey as well as, as well as southern and, excuse me, southwestern New York. And that will be on Christmas Eve. Now, accumulations will be anywhere from a trace to a few inches. And a few snowflakes may mix in with some rain in Philadelphia and New York City tonight. So temperatures will vary from below average in New England to slightly above average in southern Virginia and west of the mountains. Now, finally, we'll take a trip down south all around the Gulf over here. 75 Miami, not too bad right now. But there will be a few showers and a few rumbles of thunder as they move over the northern Gulf Coast on Christmas Eve. Now the southern Appalachians could see a half an inch of rain. Temperatures will vary anywhere from 14 degrees above average. Uh, so that's pretty good down there. But that's a look at your national Christmas Eve forecast for this December 24th, 2012. All right, happy holidays. Thanks so much, Erin. Well, looking to go into the new year with a new ride, luxury cars used to get a bad rap for putting performance first. But now, all that has changed. Luxury cars have long been criticized for putting performance ahead of the environment. 
But Ferrari's California 30 epitomizes the company's new philosophy, increased performance while reducing emissions. On average, we try to add about 100 horsepower from one model to the next, whilst cutting carbon dioxide by around 30 grams. In order to do this, the brand has embraced lighter technology and adapted certain methods that's used in Formula One racing. At this factory in Emilio Romana, trees have been planted in between the machines to control humidity in the air. And in the coming months, it's expected a hybrid car will be unveiled. It's a hybrid, yes, but a hybrid Ferrari means we have to work on how to retain energy, for example during braking, and we need to work on using this stored energy not only to reduce energy consumption, but also to enhance the pleasure of driving a Ferrari. After record sales for the past two years, Ferrari is hoping 2012 will be as successful. During 2011, 7,200 Ferraris were sold worldwide, up almost 10% on 2010. And for the first time ever, sales have hit more than 2 billion euros. Well, we think there are opportunities all around the world. Of course, there are markets where we're more cautious, like Europe, for example. But on the other hand, there are markets where the economy is growing and will continue to grow, like in Asia and China. Tutti i mercati asiatici, inclusa la Cina. In a bid to rein in the customers, Ferrari offers custom made designs to suit every taste, and demand is strong. Around 98% of clients opt for a tailor made Ferrari, adding an additional 50% to the cost of the vehicle. All right, from cars to planes now, talking about creative living. One man in Oregon with a passion for planes has decided to call one home. An Oregon man has reached for the sky and made his dream a reality. Hi, I'm Captain Campbell. Welcome to my airplane home. We've been cleared for takeoff. In college, Campbell bought stocks in Apple and IBM. The investment helped him raise enough money to buy an airplane. Craft provide the finest engineering, the most long-lived structures, a very high degree of safety, a very high degree of cleanliness, a sense of human dignity results too. Campbell's family and friends did not know until the media reported the news. Campbell said that many of his family members considered it a crazy idea. Maybe late 1997 uh, or early 1998, I decided that an airplane was, was my choice. I paid 100,000 US dollars for the aircraft itself. And I probably overpaid. I probably paid more than I should have. Um, and I spent about $120,000 on all the logistics. This aircraft arrived here in uh, 1999 on, in fact, on Halloween night, the night after the aircraft landed, it was shown on national news in America. Um, and that really shocked me. Campbell bought a plot of land surrounded by a forest. To transport the plane to his place, he cut down the trees he planted on his own. The wings and tail, which were dismantled for the convenience of transportation, were reinstalled by a lifting jack that he operated on his own. In addition, Campbell said that according to the contract, the company that sold him the plane took many of the parts away. To realize his dream, Campbell collected dozens of computers and other useful gadgets in the hope of equipping them into the plane. He's also established a website to share with others his experience. Pretty passionate about that. All right, well, coming up on Ebru today, the number of homes on the path to forced closure has declined to the lowest level in six years, but experts say that it is not all good news for the housing market. And a Christmas classic continues to resonate with readers more than a century after it was written. We'll take a look at what makes a Christmas carol timeless. Welcome back to Ebru Today. Well, for the past couple of weeks, many of us here in the U.S. have been enjoying the traditional office holiday party. However, for one group of top officials in the nation's capital, North Korea soured their Christmas cheer. Our Washington-based correspondent Robin Hamilton explains in today's D.C. Connection. Robin. 
Well, Mia, only in the nation's capital you can blame Kim Jong-un of North Korea for crashing the holiday party for high-level officials here from the State Department, Pentagon, and National Security Council. Apparently, these high-level officials were here in the U.S. enjoying a holiday party at the Japanese ambassador's residence. The holiday party, which was also celebrating the birthday of the Japanese emperor, just happened to coincide with Kim Jong-un's recent rocket launch on December 11th. Word of the launch had members scrambling back to their post, and it wasn't just U.S. officials caught off guard. Apparently, reports say a number of high-ranking Japanese officials were surprised, too. There was such a flurry of criticism about why it took the Obama administration so long to respond to this launch, but his office would only say that the delayed reaction was because they were calculating just how they would react to this launch. Either way, moral of the story, at least here in this town, don't ever let your guard down at the office holiday party. Live in D.C. with your D.C. Connection, I'm Robin Hamilton. Back to you. Good advice. Thank you so much, Robin. Well, a spokesperson for the State Department insists that officials were prepared for that launch. Well, here's a good news, bad news kind of story. While the housing market seems to be doing better than last year, it isn't all good. U.S. home repossessions rose to a nine-month high. Ebers Femi Redwood investigates this disturbing trend. Not what you want to hear less than a week before Christmas. Home seizures are rising, the first gain in two years. But financial expert and author Jordan Goodman says there is a silver lining. Banks have been repossessing more homes these days. It was actually up 11% in the latest month. Uh, the 59,000 people lost their homes to bank foreclosures. So that's the bad news. The good news is there are fewer foreclosures being started down to a 71-month low. So banks are getting more aggressive, but there are fewer foreclosures being started. He says banks are seizing more homes because, in many cases, they were just biding time. They were holding off for a long time, and the reason was there was a so-called robo-signing scandal, where they were uh, kind of going ahead with foreclosures, basically were not legitimate. Literally, a robot was signing these things. The attorneys general had an agreement with the banks not to do that anymore. And after that, then they started seizing. They'd been kind of a, a lull for a while, but now they've clearly picked up their repossession. If you're on the brink of losing your home, there is help available. What you should do is try to modify your mortgage. And the banks are willing to do that if you do it right. There's a website that can help people, which is modifymymortgage.com. There's certain underwriting criteria that the government has set up in what's called the HAMP program, the Home Affordable Modification Program, which says if you fit those criteria, you can get your mortgage modified and therefore avoid getting foreclosed upon. There's also government money out there. There's also something called the Hardest Hit Program. There's $7.6 billion that's usable in many cases that people can use to avoid getting foreclosed upon. It's a program a lot of people don't know about. Every Christmas, millions of Americans watch the story of an overworked, struggling dad named Bob Cratchit. He works day and night every day, but still can't afford to put a Christmas dinner on the table or provide health care for his son, Tiny Tim. And let's not forget his hard boss, Ebenezer Scrooge. Well, these characters and the story have been told in so many ways. To talk more about this timeless classic, we are joined by Bill Timoney. He is the cinema analyst for Ebru Today. And always so good to talk to you. You too, Mia. And always so good to talk. This is like one of my favorite stories it is of great. all time. Christmas Carol, everybody loves Christmas Carol. Well, now, the character of Ebenezer Scrooge is probably one of the great roles for an actor. I, I don't know if I can find one that's been played by more actors. I mean, think about it. <clears throat> everybody, community theaters, professional theaters, church groups, everybody does a version of A Christmas Carol every holiday season. So think about all those people since the, uh, the story was first written in 1843. And just thousands and thousands of people have played Scrooge. And it is such a terrific character because he has so many levels and he's so memorable. It's really fascinating to see how many people have tried it. Well, let's talk about mm -hmm. why people always want to do a Christmas Carol. Because if you think about like classics, um, I don't, I don't know, East mm -hmm. of Eden or something like something. Okay. I'm trying to think of something where it's a real classic um, where 
you don't see people redoing it all the time because there's always got to be a fear to redo something so great. Well, sure, but you know, my, well, my cynical answer is that uh, because it was written before the 20th century, it's in public domain, so you can do it without paying anybody. <laughs> uh, but that's just being flippant. Uh, like any great work of literature, at its foundation, it's about the search for self. It's about the human condition. And the fact that Dickens ties it into the holiday season is what makes it resonate so much during this holiday. It continues every holiday season. But I think at its core, it's about somebody who has had loss. And of course, everybody alive, as you grow, you have loss. I mean, the, the act of living is failing. You can't learn without failing. And someone like Ebenezer has failed and he's decided to stay where he is and he's, he's cut off his heart from the rest of humanity. So I think that really resonates with everybody to see someone like that who has a chance at the 11th hour to still have a happy life, to still mm. contribute back into society and to help fellow humanity and will he or won't he? And I, you know, I shouldn't say he. A lot of women have played the role as well. It's been adapted for That's actresses right. too. Yeah. Well, let's also. I was also going to say that you can also identify with Bob Cratchit, the struggling dad. You know, mm -hmm. you know. So sure. he, I think everybody can kind of uh, appreciate him as well. He's trapped in a bad job. He can't leave that job, but there's no room for advancement. But he can't afford to quit the job. Sure, that's a very contemporary. I was going to say. I was just going to say with the economy, <laughs> <laughs> everybody identifies sure. with Bob Cratchit. Sure. But I think if you look at, I mean, one of my favorite poets is a 19th century American po uh, abolitionist poet, uh, John Greenleaf Whittier, who wrote this great line. Of all sad words of tongue and pen, the saddest are these, it might have been. We have another oh. great poet who wrote about the, lo the road less traveled. Mm -hmm. And surely that is Scrooge's story arc about the path he didn't take here or the mistake he made there or what he could have done or should have done and didn't do. And again, that's something that when you watch it, you identify with it no matter who you are, no matter what path you've taken. And that's why I think, particularly in the Alistair Sim 1951 version, when, he, when Scrooge goes to his nephews for that dramatic moment, of, is he going to apologize to his nephew's wife for all the years that he has neglected them and mistreated them? I think that is the emotional moment that so, so defines what a Christmas story is and or a Christmas carol. And to have in the 51 version, the partiers are singing Barbara Allen which is this great song of remorse and regret and loss. And it, it's the old not a dry eye in the house when that moment hits. Absolutely. Now, what is your favorite one? I'm, I'm guessing that you're going to say the 51 version? Well, it's it's got to be. But like a lot of people my age, it's the first one I saw. But it also is, it, at its center, there's an extraordinary performance by Alistair Sim as Scrooge. He not only nails the big stuff, but all the small stuff as well. Yes, you know, uh, empty and cold and miserly at one end, uh, happy and joyful at the other end. But his eyes have such horror, and that we're looking at it right now. It, it, there's such emptiness, and, and, and it's just so disturbing and then so fulfilling when he finally makes that transition. Um, it's hard to argue against it. And I should say that not only Sim, but Michael Horton, the great actor who played Marley, 20 years later, there's a short animated film version of A Christmas Carol, and they both reprise their roles. Oh, is that right? Very okay. differently from what they did in 51. They're doing just for voice, but the 51 version was made for television by guys you wouldn't expect. Chuck Jones from Bugs Bunny, Richard Williams who did some Pink Panthers, and yet it won the Academy Award for Best Short Subject Animated. Well, here's a question. Yeah. Uh, as a cinema analyst, when mm -hmm. you have young viewers mm -hmm. that are maybe just going to be introduced to this wonderful story. That's a good question. Do, do you give them the 1951 version because they don't quite get the black and white thing, or do you give them somebody like George C. Scott? Well, I would go even um, further in another direction because Scott is is second to Sim in my book, both of the performance and the overall production. And in fact, Clive Donner, who was the editor on the 51 version, is the director of the George C. Scott 84 version. Is that right? Both of them. Here's the version right and there. And there you go. Um, you know, at its core, A Christmas Carol is a ghost story. That's Dickens' mm -hmm. subtitle for it. So it is meant to be scary. It's meant to be disturbing. Certainly the Sim version is very scary, even today. And the, the 84 version with Dorsey Scott and Frank Finlay, who plays Marley's ghost, is very disturbing. So for younger children, I would say go to something that's a little more user-friendly, like The Muppets. Okay. The Muppets have a great version of it, and Michael Caine gives an 
excellent performance of Scrooge in that. All right, so there's something for everyone of every age. Oh, sure. Love the story. Can't wait to watch it tonight. It's one of my traditions. <laughs> Me too. Always so great to see you. Great Happy see holidays, you too. and we'll see you back in the new year. Thank you so much. All right, coming up next on Ever Today, Egypt's opposition to alleged uh, voter fraud in the referendum on the Constitution. We'll take a look at why experts are saying this is just the beginning of a long political standoff. And an Afghan policewoman shoots and kills an American advisor in Kabul. Now authorities are investigating whether the shooting was accidental or intentional. We'll be right back with much more. Welcome back to Every Today on this Christmas Eve. Well, an Afghan police woman has killed an American advisor at the Kabul police headquarters. Kabul's deputy police chief says that they are still investigating whether the killing was intentional or accidental. It is also not known whether the victim was a U.S. military or civilian advisor. NATO's military command says it is looking into reports of the shooting. More than 50 international troops have been killed by Afghan soldiers or police this year and a number of other assaults, including insider attacks, are still under investigation. NATO forces, due to mostly withdraw from the country by 2014, have stepped, off efforts, have stepped up efforts to advise Afghan military and police units before the pullout. And serious news out of Syria as well. Dozens of people have been killed and dozens more wounded in a government airstrike on a bakery in Halfaya. That's a town recently captured by rebels. Now, many are calling this incident the deadliest airstrike of the Civil War. Since fighting began 21 months ago, more than 44,000 people have been killed. But Syria's information minister showed optimism toward the settlement of the Syrian crisis. He made the remarks during a news conference in Damascus. And ever today's Sherry Richardson is live in our New York City Bureau with the latest. Sherry. Mia, the information minister said that Syria has many religious extremist groups with their members being no different from terrorists. Omran al-Zubi, Syria's information minister, stressed that overseas opposition groups backed up armed terrorists in Syria and the information they released on the progress of their fighting were entirely groundless. The minister added that the current situation is still controlled by the Syrian government troops. He said all Syrian political parties willing for a political solution are attending the ongoing dialogues to solve the crisis through a peaceful manner. He emphasized that the future of Syria is decided by the Syrian people, and the rejection to dialogues by overseas opposition groups only prolong Syrian suffering. As for the proposal on the political transition raised by the international community, al-Zubi responded that the Syrian government welcomes it, but still needs to exchange details with relevant countries. Meanwhile, the international envoy tasked with ending Syria's civil war hopes to discuss ways of ending the crisis during a visit to Damascus. But there appeared little reason for optimism after a government airstrike on a bakery killed dozens of people. Lakhdar Brahimi, who represents the United Nations and the Arab League, has made little apparent progress towards brokering an end to the violence since he assumed his post in September, mostly because neither side appears interested in talks. Brahimi's trip, his third to Damascus since taking his post, appeared troubled from the start. Instead of flying directly to Syria as he has on previous visits, Brahimi landed in Beirut and traveled to the Syrian capital by land because of fighting near Damascus airport. Brahimi has met with President Bashar al-Assad. He said the two exchanged views on the crisis and possible steps forward, but did not discuss any details. Reporting live from New York City, I'm Sherry Richardson. Mia? Well, hey, Sherry, was there any idea what Assad said? Well, Mia, Syria's state news agency quoted Assad as saying that his government supports, quote, any effort in the interest of the Syrian people, which preserves the homeland's sovereignty and independence. Mia? We can only hope for peace in 2013 in Syria. Thanks so much, Sherry. Well, to India now. Authorities there have shut down roads in the heart of India's capital to put an end to week-long demonstrations against the brutal gang rape of a woman who is simply a passenger riding a private bus. Every today's Erin Aid joins us with more on this disturbing story. Very disturbing and tragic as well. But the Prime Minister, Manmohan Singh of India, appealed for calm and promised that the government would take action to prevent crimes against women in the future. I appeal to all concerned citizens to maintain peace and calm. 
I assure you that we will make all possible efforts to ensure security and safety of women in this country. There has been outrage across India over the December 16th gang rape that left a young woman in critical condition in a hospital. Police used tear gas and water cannons and hit protesters with batons during weekend protests throughout India. I feel deeply sad at the turn of events leading to clashes between protesters and police forces. Anger at this crime is justified, but violence will serve no purpose. The 23-year-old victim and her companion were attacked after getting a ride on a chartered bus. Police said men on the bus gang raped the woman and beat her and her companion with iron rods as the bus drove through the city for hours, even passing through police checkpoints. The assailants eventually stripped the pair and dumped them on the side of the road. The victim is being treated for severe internal injuries in a New Delhi government hospital. Thousands of armed police and paramilitary troops blocked roads in central New Delhi on Monday to prevent protesters from marching to the presidential palace. After battling the protesters throughout the day on Saturday, authorities early on Sunday banned their entry into high security zones, which also has the office of the Prime Minister of Defense and External Affairs Ministries. You know, one of the things that's so disturbing, I think, is whether or not there is a culture of sexual violence in New Delhi here. And I think people are going to continue to look into this to Absolutely. see if it's a, Absolutely. an ongoing problem. And Thanks, we'll Aaron. keep an eye on it. Yes, you're very welcome. Um, meantime, here in the U.S., the head of the National Rifle Association, or NRA, says there needs to be armed guards in schools to keep children safe. Now, those comments were made just one week after the deadly shootings in Newtown, Connecticut. The gun group refused to comment immediately after the killings, but broke their silence over the weekend. Now their remarks are generating a lot of controversy. Our Washington-based correspondent Robin Hamilton has more. And Robin, this is a very hot-button topic right now. Mia, absolutely. And it's not what many people expected in terms of this statement. You know, shortly after those shootings in Newtown, a lot of people were waiting to see what the largest gun rights group would say in response to these shootings. Well, after this most recent statement, it wasn't what a lot of people expected. And now the NRA is facing a lot of criticism from the public and from lawmakers alike. The head of the National Rifle Association, or NRA, made no apologies for his stance on how to protect children in the future after the horrific shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary. If it's crazy to call for putting police and armed security in our school to protect our children, then call me crazy. I'll tell you what the American people, I think the American people think it's crazy not to do it. It's the one thing that would keep people safe, and the NRA is going to try to do that. The declaration to have police and security guards carry weapons as they patrol schools came as a surprise to some who are calling for better gun control laws after the deaths of 27 people. In a video address, the president said he would work with Congress to create effective legislation to push for more gun control, which could be agreeable to most people. However, the NRA's unwillingness to work with any new laws has raised concern with leaders in Congress. Well, I think he's so extreme and so tone deaf that he actually helps the cause of us passing sensible gun legislation in the Congress. If it involves any new gun A number of leaders are saying they are surprised that the NRA has been so defiant. Meanwhile, the NRA stands by their, their, their position, saying that they have no intention of agreeing to any legislation that is going to put bans on weapons. Meanwhile, they are offering a proposal about how they can implement those armed security guards into schools. Mia? Oh, I'd like to ask them about that proposal and who's going to fund it. Well, here's another question for you, Robin. A lot of Republicans obviously have been very supportive of the NRA in the past. How are they reacting to his statement? Well, both of those are really good questions in terms of funding. Very expensive, and nobody has really talked about that. That could cost millions of dollars. And in terms of Republicans, well, they have been very quiet on the issue. After the shooting, they said very little. And even right now, they have not said what type of legislation they would support in terms of weapons bans. Back to you. And I'm sure we'll be talking about this in the weeks and days to come. Thanks so much, Robin. 
Well, Egypt's opposition is alleging voter fraud in the Constitution after a passed over the weekend. Leaders are now urging the government to investigate and have vowed to use any peaceful means available to prevent it from being carried out. Egyptians went to the polls and approved a new constitution. That's what state news media said on Sunday, but the headlines made it clear that the political brawl will likely continue. Supporters call it a legitimate constitution, and its passage will be watched across the Arab world. Its approval is a victory for President Mohamed Morsi of the Muslim Brotherhood, claiming it passed with a 64 percent yes vote. The referendum is not the end of the road. It's only a beginning in a long struggle over Egypt's future, and we will not allow to change the identity of Egypt or the return of tyranny at all. The opposition has alleged voter fraud and is now demanding an investigation, a sign that the referendum will not end the turmoil that has roiled this country for nearly two years since the uprising that ousted the former president, Hosni Mubarak. Egyptians had hoped the new constitution might usher in a period of more stability, but a heated political debate over the past month leading up to the referendum at times erupted into deadly street battles. But there were no mass opposition demonstrations on Sunday after the unofficial results came out, but activists continued to camp out in the capital's Tahrir Square, saying they will continue to oppose the results. We will also confront any regulations that might come out from the Shura or Upper House, Shura Council or Upper House, which might, in, might influence the interests of the people in their future. And we will also work in all democratic means to change this constitution. Well, the political tensions continue to have a toxic effect on Egypt's already precarious economy. Tourism is down. The finance ministry announced the budget deficit reached 13 billion U.S. dollars in the past five months. And the International Monetary Fund pushed back a $4 billion loan because of the turmoil. And there's a lot more happening overseas. Francesca is over at the Live Touch with a look at what the foreign press is covering and where are we starting things off. We're going from Egypt to Greece uh, over here in the Mediterranean. We begin with the Catamarina newspaper where the economist at the heart of the Eurozone negotiation says the country will not need further major austerity measures like the one that will be implemented next year. Thomas Weiser says the 9 billion euros in spending cuts and tax hikes that will be the last package of such a large scale for Greece. The Austrian also said that Greece's Eurozone partners and the International Monetary Fund have ensured that Athens will be fully funded until the end of 2014 and that if there is a need for more financing, it will be discussed next year. We also have going to India now take a look at that picture over there. We continue to follow that awful story of a gang rape on a bus. The victim of that rape, a 23-year-old student, is now said to be back on a ventilator after developing respiratory problems. Protesters have gathered at India Gate in New Delhi with reports of several people being injured. Police used batons, tear gas and water cannons against protesters on Sunday, as you can see in the picture there, in an effort to calm tempers. In all, 78 policemen and over a hundred others were injured. And to China now, look at all that snow. Continuing east where a cold snap is causing traffic delays in parts of China, two tourists also stranded on a mountain there have died. Some temperatures have fallen far below 20 degrees Celsius in inner Mongolia, Fujian and Guangdong provinces. Highways in one coastal town were temporarily closed due to heavy snow. Temperatures in inner Mongolia fell to minus 40 below over the weekend serious burr right there and to Korea now quite the picture here uh, this photo of South Korea's army's weekend duty looking at the inter-Korean border from inside the demilitarized zone North Korea launched a rocket attack you'll remember on December 12th with the first stage falling in waters off of South West Coast and the other debris falling into waters off of the Philippines well, adding to the speculation, the North's recent rocket launch was intended to rest its intercontinental ballistic missile technology. South Korean officials now say that they found a highly toxic chemical that was used to fuel that rocket launch. And on a lighter note now, we're going to end in Canada with the Toronto Star and coming right up to man's best friend.
<laughs> Saving Afghanistan's beloved war dogs. This one, a story about Canadian soldiers footing the bill for $3,000 worth to bring dogs from Afghanistan to Canada. This picture of Gordon Roy and the stray dog Guts. Let's see if we can bring him over here a little bit more. You can see his pooch. Uh, they were adopted from Afghanistan. Most of the dogs there are considered more vermin than pets and often harassed, tortured, killed, or used for fighting. So hopefully they'll have a better life in Canada and uh, just be in service as man's best friend. And just have a nice holiday. Absolutely. How about that? Pets deserve that too. <laughs> Thanks, Francesca. And if you like those animal stories, we've got much more on every today from pampered pets to endangered species. We'll take a look at animal life in 2012. That's when Ever Today continues. Welcome back to Ebru Today. Well, from endangered species to pampered pets, animals all around the world fared quite differently in 2012. To explain, we now go to Ebru Today's Sherry Richardson, who is live in our New York City Bureau. Sherry? Endangered animals were increasingly under threat from the trade in illegal bushmeat habitat loss and poached for use in traditional medicines, while at the other end of the spectrum, pets never had it so good. Roaring into the new year is a pride of Asiatic lions in West India. The Asiatic lion once roamed from Morocco and Greece to the eastern reaches of India, but now there are only around 400 remaining. In Cambodia, the sun bears are the world's smallest bear species. These creatures are under the twin threat of habitat loss and illegal hunting. Cambodia is home to the largest populations of sun bears left in the wild, and charities are working hard to save the remaining animals. One animal that could never be described as endangered is the dog. All around the world, dog lovers are pampering their precious pets at an unprecedented level. In the UK, dog owners who feel guilty about going on vacation without their pets are sending them to their own canine five-star hotel. The cost, $45 a night for luxury rooms, which come complete with a bed and flat screen TV. There's even heating and air conditioning for maximum comfort. American dogs are just as spoiled as the British counterparts. In New York City, a new iPhone app for hired dog walkers lets owners track their pets every move. The special GPS service allows professional walkers to upload updates such as miles walked, bowel movements, pickup time, future scheduled walks, and training lessons. And then the walker comments, you know, great walk. This animal pampering is a far cry from what is happening to elephants in Cambodia. With only two to three hundred elephants left in the wild, the greatest threat they face isn't from ivory hunters. Most are shot by villagers when they stray too close to farmland and crops. Others are maimed by snares or step on landmines left over from the country's war. Finally, in Vietnam, tiger bone paste sells for a few hundred dollars per ounce or a thousand dollars per 100 grams on the black market. But the country apparently is doing a good job in protecting tigers. It won the top honor this year in a global wildlife crime scorecard by the conservation group World Wildlife Fund. Reporting live from New York City, I'm Sherry Richardson for Every Today. All good stuff. Thank you, Sherry. And also receiving honors in a country where soccer is more popular than basketball, Senegal's bra uh, basketball stars of tomorrow are seeing a future of riches. They're starting to practice young and they're playing every day in the hopes of one day playing in the NBA. Basketball is on the up in Senegal. At the Seeds Academy, the only one of its kind in Africa, these young men are aiming to become professionals. Measuring 2 meters, 23 centimeters tall, Yusufa already has the raw materials to make it big. And like others, he's eyeing a future in the U.S. The NBA is, the, NBA is the highest level. It's the top. From the age of 14, the budding basketball players are housed and fed by the Sports for Education and Economic Development Foundation in Senegal. Drawn from the most promising players in the country, the students are looked after in every sense. And here, books are just as important as basketball. We try to instill human values through sport. We're not just producing basketball players, we're also producing men. Men who can be of use to Senegal, Africa and the world. Since 2003, nearly 300 players have passed through the academy. 
40 of them went on to American universities, with one, Mohamed Seni, making the leap to the NBA itself. And the people at Seeds hope that the current trickle of players coming out of Senegal will one day become a torrent. Africa is the future of basketball. Nature has been kind to Africans. And now we need to familiarize the guys with the game itself. The Seeds project is looking to take root in other parts of Senegal as it tries to promote basketball in a country where, until now at least, football has been king. A lot of hopes there. Uh, yeah, looks good to me. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Guadalajara Zoo decided to surprise visitors on Sunday with an unusual underwater sight. That's right. For the second year in the row, Aqua Claus. There he is. Yeah, he made an appearance in the zoo's aquarium. And that scary. is Octavio Nuno. He's a biologist in charge of the zoo's aquarium. But from now until Christmas Day, he is a scuba diving Santa Claus because he says he enjoys seeing the children laugh. <laughs> it's a far cry from the North Pole there. <laughs> it's going to be kind of heavy, that, that Santa suit. I, I think, I think. It looks I'm a like, scuba diver. I don't know if I'd go in that. I don't think I would either, no. <laughs> Anyway, so much for that. It is Christmas Eve, so Merry Christmas to you. Happy Holidays. And that's it for now. I'm Francesca Maxime, in for Brian Jenkins. And I'm Mia Toski. We're going to leave you now with a little Christmas caroling from Germany. We hope you enjoy it. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll see you back here tomorrow.